Welcome everyone to New South Wales DPI Dairies webinar number 20, Performance, Profit and Potential of Automatic Milking Systems. My name is Nicholas Lyons. I am the leader dairy within the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and I'm also project leader for Milking Edge, a national Australian dairy project funded by Dairy Australia, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and De Laval, supporting AMS adoption. However, today's webinar is not about me, you're lucky enough, so please let me introduce Mr. Juan Gargiulo. Juan um, holds a Bachelor of Arts Science from the University of Luján in Argentina. He worked with farm advisors and in close contact with dairy farmers throughout his life. He's got postgraduate studies in dairy science at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Um, he spent some time with us back in 2017, where he did some analysis on a technology survey that was published and he came back um, a couple of years ago as a PhD student at the University of Sydney in Australia. He currently holds and is the benef beneficiary of a scholarship from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and the Dairy Research Foundation. And Juan has been working um, with physical, financial and KPA data from different Australian farms, different AMS farms, both in Australia and overseas. And he's heavily involved in the Milking Edge project. So it's a pleasure to have Juan with us here today, sharing some of his research. So Juan, thanks in advance for your time, your preparation and your hard work, and the stage is all yours. So I'll flick presentation right to you now, and you should be ready to go. Thank you, Nico, for this great presentation, and hello, everyone. So I would like to start just a little bit what, what is a, an automatic milk, milking system, a pasture-based automatic milking system, and mainly um, in these systems, cows walk to and from the, from the dairy based on, uh, voluntarily, based on incentives, and basically they are milked in the in the dairy facility without human intervention the adoption rates of robotic milking systems um, there there is an estimation of around 25 more than 25000 farms operating in the world with uh, robots mainly there are located in europe and north america um, we can see here that the adoption rates or the per percentage of farms uh, milking with robots in North America, um, in particular in Canada, uh, reach 14% of the farms of Canada. And in some Northern European countries, uh, have reached more than 20, at least 23%. For example, in Denmark or some of the Northern European countries. In this, in this, Countries usually there, um, the systems are uh, cows are house indoors, so are um, robots with with cows house indoors. Um, on the other on the other hand, um, on pasture based system adoption rates of uh, AMS have been uh, lower than one percent. Uh, for example, in um, Australia, New Zealand, and in many countries in South America, is below 1%. So one of the questions was that we wanted to address was if this was because of lack of profitability of these systems or, or lack of uh, information about the, the benefits of this system for pasture base. All right. So the first thing we did was a comparison of robotic farms um, using data from Australian farms. And this was the first comparison in the whole world that used commercial data collected during several years and compared the performance of robotic farms versus the performance of conventional systems. And this, this article was published last a month in the Journal of Dairy Science, so you can find uh, all the, the information from, from this article there. 
it's open access. So basically the aims of, of this study was, as I mentioned, was to compare the physical and economic performance of, of AMS versus the versus conventional farms. And also the other aim was to try to identify if there were gaps for improving productivity and profitability in, in robotic farms. So we use a, a really large data set that had more than 100 indicators collected over a three year period from 2015 to 2018. Um, these indicators were physical indicators uh, and also economic indicators. So like cost incomes and different measure, measures of profit. We used 14 farms uh, that is around 30% of the total robotic farms in Australia. And we collected the data using the dairy base uh, software and of course the dairy base business analysis methodology. So this for, we, we, we put a, we, we call for an open applic uh, application for this um, project and we got 14 farms. So uh, it was, the, the process was open to all the farms from Australia and we got 14 applicants to participate in this financial project, but it was 30% of the population of AMS in Australia. And we compared uh, robots with 100 conventional farms, and we got the data of conventional farms from the Dairy Farm Monitor project. And the compare, we, we tried to, uh, we did a comparison that we try to account for the differences, of course, that there are between uh, regions. Of course, there are differences in income and, and in cost between regions. So, and also between years. And also we found that there, there, are, there were differences in the scale of the farm. So what we did was we compared the, the AMS versus CMS using models that accounted for farms for farmers that were within the same region, within the same year, and with similar herd sizes. So that we did that to, to have a proper comparison between systems. Uh, of course, we compare several uh, indicators, but we can say that overall, we found that there were no differences in the physical performance between the two systems. For example, here I put some of the main indicators like stocking rates, solids per hectare, solids per cow, and pasture utilized per hectare, and were similar between the systems. Particularly here in pasture utilized, um, the average, so this is, these are the average of conventional farms and robotic farms. Um, we found in, in pasture utilized that there was a, a big gap uh, in in robotic farms, some were achieving three uh, tons per hectare and other were grazing more than 12. So there is a, a big gap there in pasture utilization. Then we compare the overall profitability of these systems. Here I, I show two of the main indicators usually or that, that are normally used for, for overall profitability that are EBIT or earnings before interest and tax uh, and return on assets. That is the EBIT divided the total assets uh, managed uh, by that farm, by the farm. So th these are the averages. We didn't find differences between the averages in EBIT or ret and return on assets. And as, as you can see, the, the profitability was really low for both systems in comparison to the historical data. And because of course we use um, the last three years that were really tough with the drought and with the prices situation. So this of course reflects the, those three years, those last three years. But the good news are that some farms are achieving or the top 25% of the farms uh, arranged by, by profitability are achieving around 1.5 EBIT on average. So this is 
uh, what is expected by the industry of, of a number that will sustain industry growth. And here I, I also included um, the profitability of, of, the ro of the robotic farms across the dairy regions. And we can see that there, are, there is a big variability between robotic farms. I included here not only the 14 farms, but 17 that were um, farms that participated in the fourth year of, the, of, this, of this project that we, was not included, of course, in, in, the, in the publication, but it's information that we have. Um, and as, as we can see here, there is a, a big variability with some farmers achieving really, really good operating profit margin here. I, I use this indicator that is um, basically the EBIT divided the total farm income. And one of the hypotheses that we have, or one of the things that we expected from, from the technology is that or we expected that, for example, in conventional farms, labor costs will be much higher and capital costs, uh, because usually the investment is lower for conventional farms, will be lower. So th this was the uh, hypothesis that we have. So this is called capital to labor substitution. So this means that, uh, for example, if you if you adopt a role of, of, or if you invest capital, you expect to reduce labor. So this was what was hypothesized. But we found that labor cost on average were similar between both systems. Um, here labor costs are calculated using the employed labor that is a cash cost, but also the imputed labor that is allocated labor to the it's a non-cash cost and it's a allocated labor to family or, uh, or owner labor. So we found that um, both employed and imputed labor were not, not different between the two systems. And of course, the total labor costs uh, were also similar between the both systems. But we, what we found is that for one way to measure the, the labor efficiency, or yeah, the labor efficiency is by measuring the number of cows per full-time equivalent or per unit of labor. As we can see here, we have here in this graph, the 17 farms that participated in, in, in our uh, project with a really big difference or big gap in labor efficiency. We can see here that the, the average was around uh, one, 108 um, uh, cows per full-time equivalent and was similar to the conventional average that was around 100. But we found some other studies uh, that monitored five farms in Australia for a, during one year found that there are some, the average was around 180. So we are, so what, what we want to highlight is that it is possible to achieve high labor efficiency with robotic farms, but the average was similar. And if we analyze, for example, the, the bottom farms in terms of labor efficiency, these farms are um, spending 28% of the total farm income in labor costs whereas the top farms are spending 14% in labor cost. So having a higher labor efficiency or achieving higher labor efficiency, uh, of course, might impact in the, in the profitability at the end of the system. The other thing that we measured were, were some of the costs that were related to the capital invested. So normally, um, the investment is higher for robotic farms in comparison to conventional farms. And we found here that the averages uh, in depreciation, that is a loss in the uh, value of the capital, um, the interest and the least cost on the repairs and maintenance were higher for the robot systems in comparison to the conventional farms. 
So one indicator that is usually used, uh, that is normally used for measuring um, capital efficiency, let's say, or robot efficiency is the milk harvested. Uh, this, there is an error here, but this is milk harvested per, uh, per robot. So is the total milk that was collected per robot per day. And we found also here a, a big variability in, in this indicator. Um, the robot average is around 1,000 uh, liters. Uh, and we found that the potential in another project that we are also conduct, conducting was is that there are some farms achieving 1,800 uh, liters per robot per day. So there is a big gap in the potential. If we analyze some of the uh, cost related to the capital I mentioned previously, so the, the farms um, in the bottom uh, of this graph are, achieve, are spending 31% of, of these costs, uh, are spending 31% of capital cost in, uh, of, the, of the income. And the top farms here are spending 22% of the capital cost. So what we can say here is that um, or we, we think that this might, of course, if you are more efficient in the robot utilization, you might expect reduction in the cost and increases in the profitability. So at the end, the situation that, the re real situation that we have currently uh, is different to the one that we have hypothesized, but we found that, of course, there are some farms that are, are achieving a good labor efficiency and are achieving a, a lower capital cost, but the dispersion is high. So still, there is a, a big gap to, to improve in this sense. We also ask in, in this project, uh, why the farmers invested in, in AMS. And we found that in general, most of, of the farms, of course, are, are family farms, and they invested in, in AMS because of labor avail availability, heavy labor and flexibility in the, in the, in the time, in times. And only a small proportion um, responded that in, uh, invested in the technology to reduce costs. So of course, uh, maybe most of the farms are not interested in reducing uh, total labor or labor costs, but they are interested in acquiring flexibility and of course, uh, addressing those labor availability issues. So the main messages for this first a study that we conducted were that the performance and profit of robot, robotic farms is similar to the one of conversional farms. We found that some of the potential benefits like labor efficiency have not been achieved yet on average, but there are some farms that are achieving really, really high labor efficiency. And we, we think that there, there is a great or a, a really big potential to improve productivity and make this technology more profitable and attractive. So this, these were the main messages of the first of our first study. Then the second question that came up after these results was what 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 is driving profitability in robotic farms? So we conducted a second study that is almost ready for publication. In the, we aim to publish it or to submit next month. And the main aims of this study were to identify the key drivers of profitability and productivity in, in robotic farms, and also try to simulate changes in those drivers to see, for example, what were those best farms doing uh, so we can have an idea of what are the things that we, we can manipulate to achieve higher profits. 
And in this, in this case, we use a really even more extensive database. And actually, the, the most extensive database ever used, there are really no studies using economic and physical indicators uh, from several farms. So we collected, uh, we have more than 100 indicators collected over three years. We use the, the economic data from the 14 farms that I mentioned previously, but we also included data from the KPI project uh, where we have 28, 28 robotic farms from Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, and Chile. I would like to describe briefly what is this KPI project. So basically what we are doing is we are monitoring on a monthly basis the physical performance of commercial farms uh, in those countries that I mentioned before. Uh, even we have one farm now from Argentina that is not included in this analysis but is currently in the project. And the idea was to provide the industry with information about commercial robotic farms. We are monitoring more than 30 uh, key performance indicators uh, like milk production, robot utilization, and different farm demographics. For example, uh, this is an example of some of the reports that the farmers receive uh, monthly. So this shows uh, different indicators like milk harvested per robot, the cows per robot, or the milk production per cow. Um, and we can see the differences between uh, the different countries. And so farmers can, can see what is uh, what are other farmers achieving and what is their own situation. We also produce an individual report for the farm, for, for the particular farm where the farm, farmer can, can see uh, his own or her own historic, historical data and compare, for example, uh, here in the case of milk harvested per robot, the farmer can see how is uh, now and how was in the past. And he could see also the, what, are the, what is the best farm, farm in the data set or in the project achieving. So, it's a kind of benchmarking and benchmarking against another other farmers and then benchmarking against uh, his own data. So, as I mentioned, the aim of this study was to identify first the the drivers of profitability. So we what we did was we put all the economic data from the 14 farms. We put all the data from the KPI project together. And we try to find which indicators, which physical indicators um, were or explain the profitability. So we found, we put all the indicators, more than 100 in the model, and we found that there were two indicators that explain the majority of the variability in profitability in this data set. Um, the two indicators were the milk harvested per robot and the total labor. This model explained 70% of the variability in profitability. So it's, uh, it's, it's a model that explains a high proportion of, of the profitability by these two indicators. Basically, what we found is, for example, in this case, uh, if we if we have so the, the different colors uh, indicate different uh, labor amount of labor on farm. So, if you have a given amount of labor, let's say in the yellow line, uh, and we milk around uh, eleven hundred liters, we we might expect uh, operating profit margin of five percent. If we increase to 1,500 liters, uh, the profitability might, might um, increase to 15%. If we decide to not to um, not to increase the milk harvested per robot, but to reduce the total labor on farm, we might uh, expect an increase of 8% in this case. 
And of course, if we, in this situation, if we have lower labor and we increase the milk harvest per robot, we, we will expect a higher profitability. So, as I mentioned, milk harvested, well, milk harvested was the main one, have more impact that, than total labor was, was the main indicator, actually. So we use, uh, we tried, the second step was to try to identify which were the indicators or the factors that were linked to uh, milk harvested. So we put all the data from the KPI project, all the uh, indicators that we are monitoring, and this is a schematic representation of, of the drivers of milk harvested uh, with, with, the, with the relationships between, some, or with the main relationships with, between some of the main variables. And we found that there were five key variables that explain higher milk harvested or that the, the explain milk harvested. Uh, these were the number of cows per robot, the milking frequency, uh, the milk flow, time in robot, and the days in milk. This model explained 90% of the variability in milk harvested. And then, this picture doesn't mean that I like gambling, it's just that we use a type of simulation that is called Monte Carlo, and it, it is based on using uh, random numbers. And that's why it has the name of Monte Carlo, that is the city famous for the casinos. But basically, I will try to explain in a try to be in an easy way what is this simulation about, but in Denmark or some uh, a given model as the one that I show with, for example, with two inputs and that will uh, give an, an output. Normally in a, in a traditional uh, analysis, we use average values to, to predict an output. So we, we might use the average values of cows per robot and milk, milking frequency, for example, or, or, high, or the highest values or the lowest values, but we are limited to the um, to single points uh, for the predictions. Uh, in this in this simulation, the um, the nice thing is that you, instead of uh, including single points, you can uh, include the whole distribution or ranges of of values. These 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 curves are called probability distributions. So, for example. Um, for example, you can see here, uh, this is the, cows per, the distribution of cows per robot, and this is the, the most likely value, around 50 cows per robot. Uh, but this means that there are some cows, for example, there are some farms um, milking 70 cows per robot, but the, um, the, um, it is less likely that they will be able to milk uh, more than 70 cows per row. So the thing is that you can, you, instead of using single points, you can use distributions and you can also include correlations between these distributions. So for example, if you, in this case, if you milk more cows per robot, there is a negative correlation with milking frequency. So when you put these distributions, you can get an output after using random numbers and, and simulating this maybe uh, 10,000 times, you get an output of the milk harvested. Uh, that is also a, a distribution. So you can you can expect expect to have, or the most likely value will be around 1,200 uh, kilograms of milk harvested, but it is possible or some farms are achieving more. And the nice thing also is that you can, uh, you can do also simulations and start using only sections of, of these distributions. So for example, what happens if I milk more than 60 cows? So you can run the simulation again and create another um, distribution of milk harvested with probabilities or of achieving uh, milk harvested that here in this case is higher. It's around one, one, uh, 1,500 
kilos per meal or of meal per robot. So with this with this simulation, we run we run different scenarios, but here one of the main questions that we wanted to address is: it is better to increase the milking frequency or to mill more cows? What will have higher impact on the profitability of of the farms? So we run the simulation. We found that the average farm. Uh, um, is achieving 11% of operating profit margin with 1,200 kilos of milk harvested per robot with 55 cows per robot and with a, a milking frequency of 2.2%. So these are the values of the, um, the average values of all those distributions that I show. So the first thing we did is what happened if we milk increase the milking frequency to the top 25%. So this is on average 2.6 uh, milkings per, per cow per day. Well, in this case, if it is likely that the, that the farm will be able to milk less cows per robot because there will be uh, less, less space in the, in the robot. But the milk harvested and the profitability will, will remain uh, almost constant. Because of course, in, in one hand there is an increase on milking frequency, but it is likely that uh, the farm will be able to to milk less cows per robot. Have been uh, lower than we tested the scenario of improve uh, increasing the cows per robot to the top 25 percent, and this was on average 70 cows per robot. And in this case, we found that the milking frequency decreased slightly from 2.2 to 2.1, but the milk, milk harvested increased, uh, increased and also the profitability to 20%. So the main messages of, um, of this study were that milk harvested and total labor were the main drivers of profitability in robotic farms. We found that roughly for every 100 in, uh, kilos of increase in milk harvested, the operating profit margin increased uh, 3%. And we found that there is a big opportunity to increase cows per robot, that this will increase, of course, productivity and at the end, profitability. But every every farm should should um, uh, should should identify their own areas of improvement. So this is what we found in South America. It's below one percent. So what are our next steps, or what are we doing with all this data in the future? We are working and putting all this information together. Uh, in the development of a tool that will will include the data collecting from the KPI project, from the financial project, and also using existing research. And the idea that, uh, will be that this tool will allow um, conventional farms that are planning to invest in AMS to be able to analyze uh, or have realistic expectations about these systems and also the tool will be useful for current AMS farmers to uh, analyze the current situation and, and see where the farm can optimize and improve uh, productivity and profitability. So it, I think I have time so I can really uh, share or yeah, quickly what are we working on. So this is, of course, uh, we are working on it. So, but the, the concept is um, that the farmer or the user will be able to change some of the, some indicators and see the impact of changing some of those indicators on, on, on the key KPI, some of the robotic farms uh, today in the presentation. So for example, in this case, 
And, and for example, here, uh, the, the, the user can see the milk harvested that is achieving uh, in this given scenario. And here, the user can see uh, the lowest milk harvested achieving the KPI project and the highest, for example. And this allows you to, to see uh, where, where he is positioned in comparison to, to the data set. Um, of course, can, can change some of the other inputs and see, see the impact, for example, of changing the milking frequency and see the impact of, uh, in the economics also by using the models and the equations that we presented before. Also, this uh, will be able to um, identify or, or suggest a, a scenario, an optimized scenario, and then, uh, of course, the, the farmer will be able to change and, and, and to change uh, other indicators and see if, if that optimized scenario is possible to achieve. And of course, uh, we'll be able to down download the report and. Well, we are working on this. This is this is the concept, but just to highlight that all this data that we are collecting, collecting, uh, it will be used for for this tool that will be available for every farmer. Uh, so I think we have quest uh, time for questions. So happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan, for that presentation. Um, really, I do appreciate your time, but also, as I mentioned at the beginning, the hard work and all the all the work and time that you've put into into this. It started as a concept, as an idea, a couple of years ago, and there's been a lot of work um, to get to where you are now. So, I would like to encourage, in the meantime, all of the, those of you that are online to submit questions using the question tab if you want. Um, Juan, there's been a couple of questions that came through um, and I'll read them out to you. The first one is, considering the amount of robotics there are in Tasmania, was there a reason that these farms were not included? So I think that might have been maybe a misinterpretation. Uh... Can you repeat the question? Why? So the question is, considering the amount of robotics there are in Tasmania, was there a reason that these farms were not included? No, I, the, there is here, a, a, I, I realized that there was a, a, mista a mistake. So th these are the farms in Tasmania. So um, actually we have a lot of participants from Tasmania. So. Uh, were were included. Sorry, there was a mistake maybe here in the presentation. So uh. that's fine. Um, yeah, I thought they were referring to the 14 farms that were below before. So no, I think every, yeah. basically every day region, every state had farms represented. Yeah. So yeah, that's why when you look at 14 farms or 17 farms in this graphic, it seems like a small sample size, but but. And that's why we decided to publish this as an open access publication that any of you can access. And the register the link was in the registration form because because it is quite unique. Like it is the only study that has real commercial data from different regions across different years um, and with no assumptions. So I think that's good. There's another question saying in your study you suggest there is a straight line relationship between profit and production. Shouldn't that be a diminishing response curve? So I think that refers to the curves where you did the example of of the predictions and labor. Yeah, well, um, the the model that we use is a is a linear model, but when you, as I mentioned, when when you incorporate to that model the simulation, the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, gives a realistic curve, so um, so it's a combination of the linear model and the and the probability distributions that I show that uh, that reflects the the a more realistic scenario that gives what we think is a, a, a robust analysis and a more realistic scenario. That of course that that's why I 
I mentioned the Monte Carlo simulation. If you if you use for the predictions just the linear model, it's not realistic. But once you you incorporate that distributions and you you use the randomness in those distributions, uh, robots, uh, the analysis becomes really more robust and more realistic. So. Yeah, because it's taking the whole distribution of, of variables that you see, and, and I think that's also the, the power there is in this type of study, that we, like, you're using real data from real farms to build kind of dynamic tools that are going to help farmers or service providers have realistic expectations of what to achieve. So if you put 10 cows more in the system, it's highly unlikely that nothing will change. It's, it's, it's likely that that will have an impact on other things. And you're able to simulate some of those scenarios through that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So what I want wanted to show was how the linear that linear um, model worked, or how was the, the relationship. That that was the thing that I wanted to highlight. But the the, the key component of the analysis is the, the other simulation that uses the distribution that gives. Uh, a really realistic uh, analysis of the situation. Perfect. Then uh, another question, Juan. If you think most of the farmers were not necessarily wanting to reduce labor, but they were more around flexibility and labor routines and management, do you think then, given that it's labor and milk harvested per robot, what drives profit, farmers should be looking at how to optimize milk harvested per robot and different techniques to optimize that? Yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I would say that most farmers will, will go in that path. And actually, if you, if you increase the, the milk harvested, uh, maintaining the same labor at the end, you will reduce the, the, the labor cost per output. So at the end, you will increase, of course, if you increase the milk, milk harvested, uh, at the end, you will uh, increase the, the labor efficiency, uh, maintaining the same labor. So, yeah, I'm uh, almost convinced that the path is try to optimize uh, or improve the milk harvested per row. Yeah, I think the other important thing that you mentioned towards the end was that it's good to recognize where there is room for improvement, but then every farmer will find different ways of, of improving and every farmer and every farm will, will try to, will have to determine kind of how far do they want to push those boundaries because yes, the potential might be really high and far away, but not every farmer or every farm will will want to, to be running kind of those levels because obviously it, it is important to, for all of you to know that if you're going to be, I don't know, operating the robots 21 hours per day harvesting 2,000 liters per box and like everything has to be humming and working fine and and if the robots are not kept up to service and maintenance is not proper and the robots stop working for an hour that has an impact on the system or if you need to wash like certain things or weather might have a, uh, an impact on cow traffic so it's always good to have a buffer in there. Yeah. So Juan, have you tested the model with, with some farmers or have you used this to test some of the data kind of moving forward? Not yet, but is the is the part of the next steps. So we are uh, as I mentioned, we collected a fourth year of economic data, but uh, we are collecting the fourth year of the KPI project. Um, so the idea is in the future test all these models and equations and validate them with the the fourth year so this is this is part of the the tool development uh, and the next next steps that uh, we plan to to address or with the next steps that we are uh, seeking excellent well juan i, I want to thank you very much again for for your time um, and, and for all your hard work. Um, and we'll circulate the link to the paper for those of you that haven't seen it. And the model will hopefully 
not far away be available to everyone. So we really look forward to that too. Thank you, Nico. No and worries. You, uh, of course. No, sorry. No, I, I was going to say, uh, of course, if there are uh, other questions that may might come up, uh, you can send us an email and happy to, to answer them. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Somebody asked if the recording will be available. The recording will be available. All our webinars are recorded, so we'll share that recording afterwards with all of you. Um, so I want to thank all of you for joining today. I would like to invite you to follow and join our initiatives. So the New South Wales DBI Dairy website um, is available online. If you look for dpi.nsw.gov.au and look for the dairy section, there's a lot of tools and resources there. We also have the New South Wales DBI Dairy Facebook page. So have a look at that to, to get the latest updates on on key aspects for the dairy industry, but with strong focus, particularly the, the Facebook page around precision dairy farming and robotics. Um, also, um, we have more initiatives that are specific to robotic milking. We've got an online AMS community um, that is hosted on extension OZ. So there's articles that we publish there. There's a calendar of events. Uh, you can submit um, questions to the experts. So there's 25 experts that collaborate on the background to share knowledge and experience. So you can jump on there, type a question and ask the expert, and the experts collaborate to, to answer those questions wherever possible. We also have an e-newsletter e that goes out four times a year to more than 550 subscribers. So if you have not subscribed yet, feel free to jump online to the website and subscribe um, to access the latest on precision dairy farming and robotic milking. Um, and last but not least, we've launched what we've called the online AMS modules. Um, there are some information packages for those of you interested in AMS. You can access them on the link that is on the website at the moment. Um, we've so far released three modules. AMS generalities, incentive management, and reproductive performance. So the idea is that this is an online module that you can work at your own pace, and it covers all the main aspects of automatic milking specific to that topic. So how to manage incentives and understand incentives, how to manage reproduction, what is different from AMS compared to conventional. By, by profitability. RH. The idea is that this can be used for farmers um, that are looking at AMS as an option moving forward or for service providers that are working with a farmer that has decided to install this. But also if you're a farmer that is operating AMS and you bring somebody new on board to the farm, it's an excellent tool and resource that they can step through to learn kind of the basic principles um, around the technology. So this is part of the Milking Edge project. It's freely available to any of you, if you jump online, you need to register um, on the platform and then you can access all the modules. Those three are available now, as I mentioned before, and there's another one that is about to re be released around labor and routines, but there's also another one in the pipeline around assessing system performance, economics, infrastructure. So feel free to jump online and explore all of those. Um, the profitability of so once again, for more information, I encourage all of you to visit the dairy section of the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries website, where you will be able to access a lot of tools and resources about the dairy industry. Once again, thank you very much for joining today, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.